I will talk to you uh, about the promises of quantum revolution. What do I mean by that? I will explain to you what it means, how it came up, came to be. In fact, we talked today about three quantum revolutions, and I will uh, try to let you get out of here, those of you that are not physicists, with an idea of what quantum mechanics is and how we can use it, actually, to build technology that we can use every day. So let's start right away with uh, three simple concepts. I'm sure you have heard about them many, many times, and uh, I'm sure you've been wondering what exactly they are, how we explain them, how they came to be. So I will go through those co three concepts, um, and then I will explain to you a little bit that this was actually a struggle to get to really understand how those three concepts can explain the reality, the fundamental properties of matter and interactions and everything that is around us. So let's start with the quantum superposition. So the idea that a quantum state, if you can think of fundamental particles, for example, exists only in a superposition of state. Uh, the classical example that you can use, for example, if you look at the coin that's pictured in the, in the, in the slides just be, behind me, so the difference is that if you, if you have it in your hand, then you can clearly, very easily see if you're looking at one face or the other. But if you spin it over a surface, over a table, then the two faces are really merging into each other, overlapping. You can't tell which is which. The only way to actually see them is by stopping it. So you can't say anything until that, that, uh, that coin has stopped spinning. This is something that gives you a Picture, uh, helps you picture in what actually means when you do when, when you're thinking about quantum states and this is a very important property which we can use today for example to build um, quantum computers it gives us the possibility to store an, a, a much larger amount of information that you could on classical devices Tunneling is another interesting, uh, interesting uh, topic. The definition of tunneling is a particle, a fundamental particle, for example, can go through a, a barrier, an energy barrier, even if it doesn't have enough energy to actually do so in principle. Okay? So this has been observed. This happens all the time. But I'm sure you experienced that also when you go up the mountains. How many times you felt like you did not have the strength to actually go all the way up and then maybe go down the other way? And wouldn't it be great to actually see a tunnel, you know, completely flat path that would allow you to go through the mountain without expending so much energy, okay? This is actually another, another concept that we can use to build more powerful tools for our computing, more powerful computers, okay? And I will get back to it. Entanglement is the third concept I wanted to talk, to talk to you about. It's also something you will hear more about later on through the evening, so I will not spend much time. Let me just tell you that the idea of entanglement is one of the most, from the beginning, it was considered one of the most mysterious in some way, the most difficult to reconcile with what physicists knew at the time. It's the idea of two particles that are separated in space and they can still be linked to each other. They can still influence each other in some way. So this is a concept that was introduced very early on in quantum mechanics, and it was really one of the things that physicists at that time, that many physicists at that time could not accept. So they were really trying to find alternative explanation rooted in classical, in what we knew about physics up until then, in order to explain it. So, why do I stress how difficult or how, um, uh, how far from the reality we, we all know those kind of concepts feel? Uh, because indeed, once they were introduced at the beginning of the past century, we, we started to experience what is today called the first quantum revolution. In fact, people tend to think about three of them, two of them. One happened already in the, in the beginning, through the, let's say, past century. Another one through, our, through the 21st century. And there are also people talking about the third quantum revolution that's already going to, oh no, about to happen. Once this technology will allow us to really bring disruptive changes to the way we do science and we use technology today. So let's start at the very beginning. I mentioned uh, three principles uh, of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is one of the most 
exciting and successful theories in recent history, scientific theories in recent history. It all started at the beginning of uh, the 20th century with names, with physicists that you might have heard of, Max Planck, uh, Einstein, Eisenberg. They all contributed their own little bits and pieces that helped us arrive to what we know today and to actually build technology that you can use uh, daily. Transistors already many, many years ago are possible because of what we learn through quantum mechanics, GPS systems, lasers, okay? All of those, those technologies that are very friendly and familiar, I would say, they are possible because we learn how to interpret reality through quantum mechanics. The idea, for example, of a duality between particles and waves. You can think of a particle as if it were a small packet of waves, and they behave in the same way. Um, Entanglement, as, as I mentioned before, and this idea of superposition. So, so that's why we talk about first quantum revolution. The initial idea is a quantum mechanic, the struggle through the scientific community to, to understand how it actually, it, the new ideas could be reconciled, could be matched to what was already known and what was observed through experiments. And then the, let's say, the, all of the technology implications that came from it. So CERN did participate in some way to bringing up this quantum revolution, okay? That, that you know, w we, we talk about it in, in the years 2000s, but it's actually started much earlier when John Bell was working at CERN and, and he um, proposed a mathematical proof uh, that actually showed that some of the concepts, some of the phenomena that quantum mechanics can explain cannot be explained by any other theory, any other pre-existing classical theory, okay? So he gave us a proof that we need quantum mechanics to explain some of the behaviors that we see around us today, that explains how fundamental particles work. And that was a very, very important step. At the beginning, his work was a purely mathematical proof. I am an experimental physicist, I want to see things. So, so in some sense, you know, I could look at that as something that is very detached from reality, but it was a very important tool because through the years, so this, was, this happened in the 60s, and through the years, that was the seed of a series of experiments that actually proved in many different contexts that his initial ideas and his explanation and the need for a quantum, for a quantum explanation of reality was actually true. In fact, this led to the Nobel Prize in Physics last year. Um, so, this is, it, this is how it started. It was, again, kind of a struggle, a long path, a lot of physicists that contributed their own way, paradoxes that were proposed, and explanations that came ma many years after in, in, in some cases, okay? Uh, what do we know today about quantum? Actually, we know that we can use it in many, many different ways. What really changed in what we call the second quantum revol revolution is the fact that we, let's say, we understood so well how quantum mechanics work that we are now able to build artificial quantum states. We can produce them at a very accurate level and we can leverage them in our technology. Okay. So we can build sensors to do better detectors, to do better imaging, for example. We can build computers to store more information than we could with classical computers and to perform operations and perform algorithms at a much higher rate, much faster, more efficiently, hopefully. Um, we can simulate processes that, you know, otherwise would require entire huge clusters of classical computers to simulate. And we can do that just with a handful of qubits. Uh, and then there is the whole discussion about quantum communication. This is something that the general public is very, very interested in. And it's all the discussion about security, how, how quickly and securely we can share information across maybe different regions in, in the world. Okay, so the possibility through entangled states to actually transmit information across long distances. So all of this, is something that exists in many, or is being studied in many different fields of science. But what is it the CERN is doing today concerning quantum, okay? John Bell was working here. Somehow we started or we contributed to the beginning of the quantum revolution. What are we doing today about this? So since 2020, CERN has launched its quantum technology initiative. And the idea of this initiative was really to try and understand 
in the most, I would say, um, re uh, realistically possible possible condition, do you say that in English? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but but in, in, in conditions that would be as realistic as possible, what is the impact of this kind of technologies? Okay? Because we are physicists, we need to be able to understand exactly to which extent we can use this, what does it mean to use it, how can we maybe use physics to improve it? And so if you look at the, the four major main areas, topics that the QTI covers, you can see that kind of maps uh, map the, the four main areas I mentioned before of how people are using or are looking into quantum in the, in the, in the, um, in the world. So we started looking at it from a theory perspective. So can we use quantum computing to simulate physics processes? This seems just, you know, reasonable because physics, what we do here is actually explained by quantum mechanics natively, okay? Those are, this is the house of quantum mechanics. It should be very fast. Um, we are looking at communication point of view. We are looking at sensing. We are very building uh, accurate, good detectors is something that is very, very important for us. So can we leverage quantum mechanism to, do, to build better detectors? This is, this is a crucial, crucial task that the community at CERN has. Let me just remind you that we are the largest laboratory for particle physics. We have at the moment the largest accelerator. This is in general the largest experimental facility that you can find worldwide. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is, is, is generating collisions in four main uh, detectors, and each one of them, they have uh, different, uh, different uh, let's say, uh, uh, objectives. Well, some of them overlap, but they, they also have each one of them their own their own uh, specialty. Okay, and um, you can think of all of them though as very big cameras that take very precise, high resolution pictures of what uh, each collision pr uh, produces. Okay. Um, LHC is uh, kilometers and kilometers long. So we are talking about petabytes and petabytes of data. This is definitely, definitely a very big computing challenge. So all of the physics that we know that, that uh, CERN physicists could do up until now was possible thanks to a, a huge computing infrastructure. It was the example of the first large-scale distributed infrastructure many, many years ago. It's called the LHC Computing Grid, and it's a network of computing centers that is spread all across the world. So that was needed, for example, to give you results like the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. And as I said before, we already know that L WLCG, so the LHC computing grid, as we use it today, will not be enough to face all the challenges that we, we are, are ahead of us with the, with the next generation detectors. Okay, so there are many technologies physicists are looking into, uh, and quantum computing is one of them. How do you think we can use quantum computers? Uh, I will give you three examples. And they are rooted, they are examples of things we are doing here at CERN, but they are also very much examples of what you can do with quantum computing in general in other fields. So one is the idea of accelerating the optimization problem. What does it mean? You need to choose what is the best possible solution given a set of uh, initial data, okay? Maybe you want to know, and I'm saying this because this is the exact example that we focused on, maybe you want to know what is the best configuration in order to focus the trajectory of a beam of particle that runs in an accelerator. This is a very, very difficult task because particles are nasty things. They're not so easy to, you know, to, 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 to um, focus. Um, what we found out is that we can accelerate and improve this process by using a quantum computer. Another example is simulation. I mentioned this before. Now, all of our experiments are targeted to learn or to understand how the data produced by the collisions work. But we also need a lot of simulation, a lot of synthetic data that we need maybe to understand how our detectors work. Okay, so we do need synthetic data. This is another very, very compute intensive task. And so this is another avenue that we are, we are learning now, we can actually approach with quantum computing.
The last example I want to give you is, well, in jargon, it would be called pattern recognition. What does it mean? <laughs> it means that if you have, for example, a cloud of points in space and you want to understand and identify which of these clouds actually belong to trajectory of something you want to trace, for example, you have data in your uh, you know, control towers from all of the airports in, in, uh, in Europe, okay, and you want to understand where each one of the planes are going and where they will go, based maybe on the trajectory they had up until that moment. This is a problem of pattern recognition, and it's actually very similar to what we do in our detector. And so we found out, again, that we could use quantum computing to trace the trajectory of particles through our detectors and also to trace airplanes in the, in the air traffic control space. So, those are very, you know, I, I really didn't spend that much time on explaining or, let's say, proving to you that what I'm saying is true. So I really encourage you to ask as many questions as you want. I would be happy to, to reply. What I want to point out before concluding is the fact that there is a lot of, um, of hype uh, around quantum technologies, but there is a, also a lot, there is also a huge, huge promise. And I think th it is very important that scientists take the time to try and understand where the impact is, where the real performance can come from without, you know, getting lost in the hype. This is uh, as, as a responsibility as men and women of science, and I think CERN is really digging very much into it. Uh, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>